You need sleep to replenish testosterone eventually. But the real question is, are you enjoying what you're doing? Dr. Huberman's enlightening revelation reminds us that our body's natural chemistry is a very delicate balance, wherein dopamine and testosterone levels are closely intertwined. This video offers invaluable insight into understanding the true value of maintaining that harmony. If you're viewing bright light in the middle of the night, you are suppressing dopamine release. If you're suppressing dopamine release, you are suppressing testosterone levels. Most people don't really understand how powerful this relationship is between light, dopamine, hormones, and all the great things that the sex steroid hormones do when they're available in your body in the proper ratios. There's a fascinating relationship between the hormone system and the nervous system. And you know, hormones work in general on slower time scales. The definition of a hormone is something is chemical released at one location in the body, goes and acts at multiple locations far away within the body. Neurochemicals like dopamine and serotonin tend to work a little more quickly. There are hormones like adrenaline and cortisol that can work very fast. But here I'm referring mainly to testosterone in humans and in animals. There's a very interesting relationship between testosterone and dopamine mm -hmm. that speaks directly to what we're talking about now. So dopamine and testosterone are closely related in the pituitary system. And obviously uh, testosterone comes from the adrenals and from the testes. But the, the major effect of testosterone is to make effort feel good. That's what testosterone does. It has other effects too right? Reproductive effects, androgenizing parts of the body, etc. But it makes effort feel good. The testosterone molecule is synthesized from cholesterol. Cholesterol can either be made into cortisol, a stress hormone, or testosterone, but not both. So you have a, a limited amount of cholesterol and it gets diverted towards stress or towards test or this pathway where effort feels good. Mm -hmm. That's the pathway you want to get into. The anger pathway, if we were to just kind of play a, a mind experiment here. The anger eventually is going to divert more of that cholesterol molecule to cortisol and stress, and you will be slowly depleting testosterone. Now, going into this, you'll have plenty of testosterone, but after a couple days, there have been very interesting studies showing that testosterone doesn't necessarily drop with sleep deprivation. That's a bit of a myth. The, the takeaway from all of this is if you can just convince yourself, or ideally, if you can just enjoy yourself, you are going to maintain or maybe even increase testosterone stores, which will make effort feel good. And to me, aside from neuroplasticity, where everything becomes automatic after this experience, to me, that's the holy grail. When effort feels good, life just gets way better. And we're not talking about achieving the reward. I'm not talking about the end of this thing. I'm talking about the process of it feeling really good. Dr. Huberman's wisdom guides us to a path where effort becomes an exhilarating experience, unlocking your true potential. Imagine the boundless possibilities, the, the, the unyielding progress, and the unstoppable beast within that awaits realization. Through understanding and embracing the importance of effort, we can transform ourselves into the ultimate version of who we're meant to be. Hormones are powerful. The relationship between thoughts and hormones and these physiological things is enormous. I had a colleague that a, a few years ago, he was dying of, of pancreatic cancer. And I was interviewing him just because he's an important figure in our community and I was a friend. And there was one day where he, he told me, he said, you know, I don't want to make it past the new year. I just, and it was, it was crushing for me to hear. And I knew that he had been on some androgen therapy um, for, a, for a whole set of other things. And I, I said, you know, um, have you taken your andro androgen cream? And he was like, no, I haven't done it. Go get it for me. I have this on film. He takes it, he puts the androgen cream on. 10 minutes later, he says, you know what? I think I wanna live into the new year and I'm gonna write 12 letters of recommendation. And he did. And so there's something about these molecules that in an ancient way, in all organisms, all ma mammals, as far as we know, are linked to the will to live. They're linked to effort and making effort feel good, which has been fundamental to the evolution of our species. I always say, people think that the opposite of testosterone is estrogen, but it's not. The opposite of testosterone is prolactin, which makes us feel quiescent and not in pursuit of things, etc. Testosterone makes effort feel good. Estrogen makes emotions feel okay. Dr. Huberman emphasizes the significance of achieving a harmonious balance between estrogen and testosterone for our emotional well-being. 
This equilibrium paves the way for a stronger, more resilient emotional foundation, allowing us to navigate life's challenges with grace and fortitude. So just as there are behaviors that can increase testosterone, there are behaviors that can decrease testosterone. And one of the most well-characterized ones in humans is becoming a parent. Expecting fathers have an almost 50% decrease in testosterone levels, both free and bound testosterone. As well, their cortisol levels, a stress hormone, drop by almost threefold, which is incredible. And their estradiol levels double. So their estrogen levels double. So expecting fathers, many people have known, put on additional body weight. Everyone always thought that it's because they're eating in parallel with their pregnant wife. But it turns out that these effects of reduced testosterone, increased estradiol, and reduced cortisol can all be explained by an increase in prolactin. So not just in humans, but in other species as well, when the male and female of that species are expecting young, they lay down more body fat. The assumption is that this is to prepare for long nights of no sleep, which occurs in many species, not just in humans. So it's really interesting that this hormone prolactin can start suppressing whole categories of hormones, sex steroid hormones, and can start increasing whole categories of other ones. So we hear about the dad bod. There are a lot of explanations for the dad bod, but it is a well-known phenomenon that testosterone is going to drop, prolactin is going to increase, estradiol is going to increase in males and females that are expecting children. The other behavior that markedly reduces testosterone in both males and females and markedly reduces the desire for seeking sex and sex itself is illness. And many of you might say, well, duh, when people feel sick, they don't feel like seeking out mates and they don't feel like having sex. But have you ever wondered why that actually is? Well, it turns out that it can be explained by the release of what are called inflammatory cytokines. So cytokines are related to the immune system. They travel in the lymph and in the blood and they attack invader cells like bacteria and viruses. And under conditions of illness, we make a lot of different cytokines. Some of them are anti-inflammatory, but some of them are pro-inflammatory. And the best known example of a pro-inflammatory cytokine is IL-6. And it's known that IL-6, when injected into individuals, will decrease the desire for sex and eventually will reduce levels of testosterone and estrogen, independent of feeling lousy. So the reason why people don't want sex when they're sick is because levels of IL-6 are increased. Now this is important because as we start to think about the different ways to modulate the sex steroid hormones, so-called optimize the hormones, in short and put simply, inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 are bad for sex steroid hormones. We all know, because now we've been told a lot in the last decade or so, that getting proper sleep is important for all these aspects of health. Getting proper sleep can um, really offset all the reductions in testosterone and estrogen and reductions in fertility that occur if we don't get enough sleep. But seldom is it discussed how sleep actually adjusts things like testosterone and estrogen. And it does it by modifying cortisol. So the molecule cholesterol can be converted into testosterone or estrogen, but there's a competition whereby the cholesterol will turn into cortisol and not testosterone, or it'll turn into cortisol and not estrogen if stress levels are too high. So the simple version of this is getting your breathing right during the waking hours, meaning primarily unless you're working out really hard or there's some other reason why you're maybe eating or speaking, you need to be breathing through your mouth, you should be a nose breather. There's really good evidence for that now. And in sleep, you also want to be a nose breather because that's going to increase the amount of oxygen that you're bringing into your system and the amount of carbon dioxide that you're offloading. There are other positive effects of it as well, but you're basically reducing apnea. Breath holding in sleep leads to buildup of carbon dioxide and leads to increases in cortisol, which then decrease testosterone and decrease estrogen in negative ways across all sexes. Okay, so the simple version of this is get your breathing right. So how do you do that? How do you get your breathing right? Well, for some people that have severe sleep apnea, they're going to need the CPAP machine. This is a machine that you actually put on your face and it helps you breathe properly in sleep. In the daytime, the best way to get good at nasal breathing is to dilate the nasal passages because a lot of people have a hard time breathing through their nose. 
And one way to do this is to just breathe through your nose more. And one way to do that is that when you exercise, in particular cardiovascular exercise, most of the time, provided you're not in maximum effort, you should be nasal breathing. Becoming a nasal breather can have all sorts of positive effects by reducing cortisol, reducing apnea, and indirectly raising testosterone and estrogen in the proper ratios. So this might seem kind of foundational and indirect, but when you go into the scientific literature, it comes through as one of the most powerful things that you can do that is zero cost, takes a little effort, but it's zero cost, and it has all these positive effects across the board, you know, both cosmetic and in sleep and hormonal, etc. Viewing bright light within the first hour of waking, whether or not it's from artificial light or ideally from sunlight, has these powerful effects on sleep and wakefulness. But we have to return to this if you want to understand how light can impact hormones because hormones, light and dopamine have a very close-knit relationship. So much so that your light viewing behavior can actually have a direct effect on hormone levels and fertility. It can have a direct effect on hormone levels and libido. It can have a direct effect on hormone levels and your ability to heal quickly. Several species of animals, many species of animals in fact, like rabbits and fox and various mustelids like ferrets and ermines change their pelage color across the seasons. So dopamine has a precursor. That precursor is tyrosine, which, come, which is an amino acid, comes from food. But the precursor to a lot of the melanin-producing elements of cells that give pigmentation, including for the hair, is tyrosine and tyrosinase, an enzyme. So yes, the same amino acid-based pathway and many of the same enzymes that are devoted to dopamine and dopamine-increasing the sex steroid hormones are devoted to giving pigmentation to the hair and skin. And this is why in the summer months, when days are longer, animals are breeding more. And this is also why in the winter months, when days are shorter, animals are breeding less. This is also why in humans, many people, not all, feel an elevation in mood in the spring and summer months because of the amount of sunlight they're getting is increased relative to the winter months. Increased viewing of sunlight, and it has to be to the eyes, it's not to the skin. Increased viewing of sunlight increases dopamine levels in the brain. Increased dopamine levels in animals and humans increases the amount of these melanocytes and the activity of these melanin-producing cells, which give pigmentation to the skin and hair, and indirectly increase the amount of testosterone and estrogen and thereby reproductive behavior, feelings of well-being, social interactions, reductions, anxiety, etc. All of which should make sense based on what we've talked about already in terms of the biology and the impact of these uh, steroid hormones on various aspects of the mind and body. This translates to the protocol of if you want to optimize testosterone and estrogen, you need to get your light viewing behavior correct. It's not just about optimizing your sleep, which is also important. It's about getting sufficient amount of light in your eyes so you have sufficient levels of dopamine. But it means getting anywhere from two to 10 minutes of bright light exposure in your eyes early in the day. It is not sufficient to do this with sunglasses unless you have to do that for safety reasons. It's fine to wear prescription lenses and contacts. If you can't get sunlight for whatever reason, you want to use bright artificial light. But that is absolutely critical for timing the cortisol release properly, limiting cortisol release to the early part of the day, getting increases in dopamine that are going to promote the production of testosterone and estrogen to healthy levels. The other aspect of light viewing behavior that's extremely important is to avoid bright light exposure to your eyes in the middle of the night. If you're viewing bright light in the middle of the night, you are suppressing dopamine release. If you're suppressing dopamine release, you are suppressing testosterone levels.